A possible government shutdown looms, what we know so far. 200 gather at the Capitol to support the pro-life movement. And cars drift away as large waves hit the Washington State coast. Powered by the Montana Television Network. This is the 10 o'clock news on KAJ, Montana's news leader. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Don Fisher. As Congress tries to avoid a government shutdown tonight, political opponents of Montana's U.S. Senator John Tester are pointing the finger at him and other Democrats, saying that they are to blame. Tester, up for re-election this year, has said he'll oppose the Republican short-term budget fix before the Senate, and some Democratic votes are needed to pass the bill to keep the federal government funded. His position sparked a steady stream of criticism aimed at Tester on Friday from GOP campaign groups and party figures calling Tester a hypocrite. They point to a speech Tester made on the Senate floor in 2013 when he criticized Republicans for forcing a shutdown. State GOP Chair Deborah Lamb says Tester is aligning himself an extremist liberal party, but holding out for immigration reforms. But Tester took to the Senate floor himself this afternoon, saying he'll no longer support short-term budget bills and that it's time to fund the government for the rest of the year. But for 111 days, the leadership on the other side of the aisle, and I mean intentionally so, I believe, have played politics and kicked the can down the road. This is not nuclear physics, folks. This is about funding our government. It's not that tough. Representative Steve Daines told Montana reporters tonight that he's supporting a short-term fix and that he expects an easy vote in favor. He says it will fund the children's health insurance plan and that a larger budget deal can be worked out by early March. It's not clear yet when or if the Senate will vote on the short-term funding bill. The operators of the lodges in Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks are monitoring the possibility of a federal government shutdown and how that could impact visitors who have booked trips. Zantara says it's received no official word of what the National Park Service will do with park units if Congress is unable to reach a spending agreement by the end of the week. And in a statement on the company's website, Zantara says, We remain optimistic that Congress will reach a resolution or, failing that, permit the national parks to remain open. If a government shutdown does occur that leads to closure of the national parks, we will be in contact with you via email or telephone to advise you of the situation, and then we will work to reschedule your trip or refund your deposit at your discretion. And Zantara says if visitors are in a park and the shutdown does come down, they'll be refunded for the unused portion of their trip. In this time of year, most of the properties in Glacier are closed, with the exception of Cedar Creek Lodge, which is outside the park. However, several locations do remain in operation during the winter in Yellowstone. And switching to weather, more snow is expected for the weekend in northwest Montana as we make our way through this weather system, but we may get a break on Sunday. For more of what you can expect, let's toss it over to Chief Meowdist Aaron Yost, who has our first forecast. Aaron? Yeah, we're definitely going to see some lightly scattered snow as we head into your Saturday right now. Pretty quiet out there in northwest Montana, although a lot of cloud cover still hanging around. Notice just to the south of us still holding on to some of those scattered snow showers. More or less, this is what we're going to expect to see throughout the day tomorrow. A few peaks of sunshine very similar to what we saw today going to be expected on Sunday brief break in this active weather pattern Sunday night into Monday though we could be talking our next system our next more organized system moving in with a slight chance some light valley accumulation I've got details on that coming up soon all right, thanks, Aaron. A Flathead County woman charged in connection with the murder last year accepts a plea deal. 25-year-old Heather Joy Meeker's tampering with evidence charge was dropped Wednesday in Flathead District Court, and she was released from jail for a crime that took place last year in Evergreen. As part of the deal, Meeker pled guilty to misdemeanor bail jumping charges and was sentenced to six months in the Flathead Jail. But she was released for the time served. Meeker was charged with felony bail jumping after failing to appear at a pretrial conference in July. Meeker was the girlfriend of Cecil Thomas Rice and was present when he pushed another man, 34-year-old Andrew Walters, off a bridge into the Flathead River in Evergreen in April. Meeker told detectives that Rice was upset over inappropriate comments that Walter made about her earlier in the day and that he drowned in fast-moving water and that after the crime they left and found a backpack that she believed belonged to Walters and threw it out the window of a moving vehicle. Rice was convicted of deliberate homicide in December and is due in court for sentencing later this month. A man is set to stand trial in April for attempted murder in connection with the shooting at a Hungry Horse home last September. 
22 year old Brian McCauley pled not guilty to the charge on Wednesday and prosecutors say in court documents that McCauley went to the home of one of the people involved in an altercation at a Hungry Horse bar earlier in the evening and fired over 20 rounds into the home with a rifle. Florida County Sheriff Chuck Curry told MTN News that people were inside the home at the time, but nobody was seriously hurt. Investigators recovered about 28 bullets from the scene. McCauley remains in Florida County Jail on $250,000 bail. A 23-year-old Victor man is being held for attempted murder after attacking his family members with broken window trim and sheep sears. For Valley County Sheriff Steve Holton said in a release that deputies and medical personnel were sent to a residence in the 500 block of Abbey Lane in Victor around 12.30 p.m. tonight for the report of a male possibly having a medical issue and assaulting family members. Holton says the man was escorted from the home after displaying very erratic and threatening behavior and later broke a window with a snow shovel to gain entry back into the house where he assaulted the victims using broken window trim and the sheep sears. Holton says both victims and the attacker required medical attention for their injuries that were not life-threatening. The investigation is ongoing and names related to the incident have not yet been released. Around 200 people gathered at the Capitol complex today to support the pro-life movement. March for Life participants held pro-life signs and spoke out against current aborting practices in the nation, stating that human life begins at conception. Two of the three or two of the Republican candidates trying to unseat Democratic Senator John Tester spoke at the event, showing their support for the movement. Keynote speaker and Senator Al Osheski of Kalispell said that the country needs to acknowledge the humanity of the unborn child in the womb. Montana State Auditor Matthew Rosendale said that for him, the march is ultimately about compassion and that we need to support women in crisis. Women need to know that if they find themselves in a crisis pregnancy situation, that they have support. There is a network out there and, and we can't just turn our backs to that. And in Washington, thousands of demonstrators rallied in the annual call to outlaw abortion. The demonstration has taken place every year since 1973, but this time they're hopeful a new president and Supreme Court justice can turn back the landmark case known as Roe versus Wade. President Trump spoke to the crowd at the, at the right of the life march by a video link from the White House, echoing the message that the right to life begins at conception. Pro-life and pro-choice advocates on both sides are looking to a Supreme Court with a new member, Justice Neil Gorsuch, as the decades-long fight over abortion rights continue in Washington. And last year, more than 10,000 people came to Helena to stand for women's rights. And this year, the marches are being localized across the state, with one being held in Kalispell this weekend. The march will take place in the Depot Park in historic downtown Kalispell on Saturday. The march will begin at 12 and run until 2, and speakers will begin at 12.30. Organizers encourage anyone to come, but they ask you to leave your pets at home and dress for the cold. Outspoken Nevada rancher Cliven Bundy is coming to Montana this weekend, scheduled to make a Saturday appearance in Paradise in Sanders County. Bundy was just exonerated this month on charges of defying federal authorities in a dispute over grazing rights. He'd been in prison for the past couple years facing charges for the standoff at his Nevada ranch, along with his sons and Ryan Payne of Anaconda. The case was thrown out by a federal judge in Las Vegas earlier this month, and Bundy was also a central figure in the armed standoff at an Eastern Oregon wildlife refuge two years ago. In the meeting Saturday evening in Paradise is expected to touch on the thorny issue of federal management of public lands and is being sponsored by the Coalition of Western Property Owners. State emergency managers say they won't appeal the federal government's decision to deny millions of dollars additional aid to deal with Montana's historic 2017 wildfire season. Leaders asked the Trump administration to declare a major disaster in response to the dozens of huge fires and thousands of smaller ones that burned across Montana, and that would have given the state access to $44 million in federal aid. But FEMA leaders denied the request, saying the damage wasn't so severe to be beyond the state's ability to deal with it. State leaders say that they want to look at possible changes to the way disasters are declared that could make them more applicable to Montana. We did not qualify for a major disaster declaration, and I think what we need to do in our downtime in between busy fire seasons is to ask ourselves why. Why isn't that hazard uh, really included in the, the national conversation? If Montana had received the aid from FEMA, leaders say it would have been used to replenish the state's fire fund, and that means the state won't have to spend more money because of the denial. Up next, Aaron is back with the rest of our wet forecast for the weekend. And extreme weather in Washington is causing cars to be swept away. That's coming up next.